Hey, my name is Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. Thanks so much for checking out this week's message. Uh, I hope that it's encouraging to you and inspiring to you. I hope that it causes you to dive deeper into the scriptures. And I hope that you're able to do that with some people around you, with some community. Um, but if you don't have that, we would love to invite you into the community here at Restore. If you want to take a next step, get more connected, you can just go to restoreaustin.org slash connect, fill out a card on there, and I will personally reach out to you in the days after you do that. And if you want to grab coffee with me or just get more information about the church, I will make myself available to you for that. As you will hear, we are in this thing called a year around the table, and it really comes from this vision that God's given us that Restore would be a place where anyone has a seat at the table and everyone experiences the extravagant love of Jesus. So A, I hope that you experience the extravagant love of Jesus as you check this message out. And B, if you don't have a table to sit at, we want to invite you to Jesus' table here at Restore. It's Easter Sunday, which means that we are here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And at one of the churches I used to work at, The pastor, every Easter, he would walk out onto the stage and he would yell, he is risen. And I'll say, so some of you have seen that, you know what I'm talking about. So it was a little corny, right? But it was a cool reminder of like how connected we all are and how the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is not just connecting us now, it has united Christians together for over 2,000 years. But what I didn't like about it is that sometimes it made people feel like outsiders, if they weren't like familiar with that annual call and response time. So I remember one year, this was very vivid to me because the pastor got up, he shouted, he is risen. And I said, he is risen indeed. And the guy next to me like jumped and almost fell out of his chair. So everybody around him started yelling and he did not know why. After he gathered his composure, he leaned over to me and he whispered, are there any other parts that we're supposed to yell during? (laughs) And it's true, the story of Jesus unites us, but I'm convinced it only unites us if we're actually telling it together, right? And not just relying on a ritual that everyone may or may not feel a part of. So I want to start today's message by doing just that. I want to tell the story of Jesus. But instead of doing it myself, we are going to watch one of the incredible videos from our partners at The Bible Project. They are simply the best at what they do. So I encourage you to check out all their videos, podcasts, trainings, etc. If you haven't already, they are incredible. This is about a four, four and a half minute video overview of the life of Jesus from the book of Luke. So I want you to check it out and then we're going to dive into what it means for us today. We've been looking at the story of Jesus as it's told in Luke's gospel. It begins with the arrival of an unlikely king born in poor, humble circumstances. Then we saw Jesus as a teacher, prophet. He went throughout Israel calling people to a radical way of life, where enemies become friends, the poor are cared for, where people find forgiveness for their failures. He went from town to town inviting people to follow him and live under God's reign in this upside down way. And he did many signs and wonders. So many Israelites began to hope that he would rescue Israel from the Romans and set up a new kingdom of peace and justice. In short, that he would bring the kingdom of God. Now, the religious leaders of the day were also hoping for God's kingdom. But to them, the message of Jesus was a threat. Yeah, they had expected to gain power and prestige when this all went down. But Jesus said God's kingdom belongs to the poor, to the outsider, and that real power is serving others in love. This conflict intensified when Jesus, while in Jerusalem, disrupted the temple sacrifices and called Israel's leaders a gang of rebels. So they arrested Jesus and they had him accused before the Roman authorities of being a rebel king. He was handed over for execution even though he was innocent. Then he was taken outside the city and put to death on false charges. This brings us to the final section of the Gospel of Luke. There was a religious leader named Joseph who opposed Jesus' execution and then requested to be given his body so he could bury Jesus in a nearby tomb. And then a couple of days later, some women who had followed Jesus came to visit that tomb and they found it open and empty. And they encountered these mysterious figures telling them Jesus was alive from the dead. So they run away terrified. Nobody believes their report. I mean, he can't be alive. They all saw him die. Now, just outside of Jerusalem, a pair of Jesus' followers were leaving the city 
traveling on a road to a town called Emmaus. And they were sad and confused about everything that had happened. Then Jesus shows up, walking alongside them, but they don't know it's him. Yeah, that's weird. Why couldn't they recognize him? Yeah, it's an odd but really significant (sighs) image for Luke. They're blind to Jesus for some reason. So Jesus asks them, what are you guys talking about? And they begin to tell him about Jesus, a powerful prophet who they expected would rescue Israel, but was instead executed. Some women say he's alive, which is crazy. It's all too much. We're going home. So Jesus tries to explain that this is what the Jewish scriptures had been pointing to all along that Israel needed a king who would suffer and die as a rebel on behalf of those who actually are rebels. And then he would be vindicated by his resurrection so he could give true life to those who would receive it. But it's still not making sense. They're as confused as ever. Which leads to the scene where they sit down for a meal with Jesus. He takes the bread, he blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them, just as he did at the Last Supper. Yeah, this is the image of his broken body, his death on the cross. And it's when they take in the broken bread, that's when their eyes are open to see Jesus. Then he disappears and the episode's over. So this is a story about how it's hard to see Jesus for who he really is. Yes, this is brilliant. I mean, how could God's royal power and love be revealed through this man's shameful execution? How could a humble man become the king of the world through weakness and self-sacrifice? It's very hard to see. But this is the message of the Gospel of Luke. It takes a transformation of your imagination to see it and embrace Jesus' upside-down kingdom. The Gospel of Luke ends with Jesus and all of his disciples together over another meal. And everyone's freaking out about his resurrected body. I mean, he's still a human, but way more. Yes, he's passed through death and come out the other side, a walking, talking piece of new creation. And then Jesus tells them that he's going to give them the same divine power that sustained him so they can go out and share the good news of God's kingdom with other people. After this, Luke tells us that Jesus was taken up into heaven, which is a cool exit and all, but why disappear into the sky? So in the Old Testament, the skies are the place of God's throne. They're above everything. So this is Luke's way of showing that Jesus has been enthroned as the divine king of the whole world. His followers stay in Jerusalem, worshiping God and Jesus, waiting for this new power. And this is where the gospel ends. So that's the story. That's the story that has united Christians together for 2,000 years. And it's the story that we are here to celebrate this morning. But I think that the most moving part of that video, and really the story for me, is when the narrator says, it's hard to see Jesus for who he really is. How could God's royal power and love be revealed through this man's shameful execution? How could a humble man become the king of the world through weakness and self-sacrifice? It's very hard to see. This is undoubtedly true. Whether it was in the first century that Jesus lived or the 21st century in which we live today, it's hard to see Jesus for who he really is especially when his name is constantly being co-opted by by all sorts of people and organizations who don't seem to reflect his values at all. It's also hard to understand how God's love fits into all of this. I think maybe that's because God's love is so unlike the love we often see and experience in our world today. You see, in our world, love is often conditional, but God's love is unconditional. In a world where love sometimes gives up too easily, God's love never runs out. In a world where love is sometimes superficial, God's love is anything but. It's sacrificial. In a world where love is finite, God's love never ends. And in a world where love is frequently transactional, I'll give you something if you give me something back, God's love is freely given to anyone who wants it. If you've been to an Easter Sunday service before, chances are you've heard someone preach that the cross and the empty tomb demonstrate God's love for humanity, and that's true for sure. But it can also be a little misleading, because the way it's often presented makes it feel like God didn't really love us before those events occurred. Like Jesus' death and resurrection somehow allowed God to finally tolerate us. But the death and resurrection of Jesus isn't the reason God loves us. It's the revelation of his love that's been there all along. I'm going to say that again because that's important. 
The death and resurrection of Jesus is not the reason God loves us. It's the revelation of his love that's been there all along. So for instance, he wasn't like really mad at us, but then had this big change of heart because of the cross. And he wasn't disgusted with us, but then decided we were finally acceptable because of the resurrection. God has always loved us, and he always will. Love drove him to the cross. The cross did not drive him to love. I love how Brennan Manning says it. He says, God is not moody or capricious. He knows no seasons of change. He has a single, relentless stance toward us. He loves us. Single, relentless stance. And in fact, love isn't just something God does. It's who he is. And it's who he's always been. And let me show you what I mean by that. The rest of our time together this morning, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 4. So if you have a Bible or a phone or anything like that, you want to find it. The verses will also be on the screen behind us. If you don't know where it is, you're looking for it in your Bible. It's toward almost the very, very back of the New Testament. 1 John chapter 4. Now, if you've been a part of Restore even for a little while, you know that we really never like to study a Bible verse or a passage out of its context. So let me give you some background on the book of 1 John. So the first thing is it's actually not a book. It's a letter. And it was written by a guy named John. And most scholars think it's the same guy who wrote the Gospel of John, which is one of the four accounts of Jesus' life. So John, y'all, he was not only a disciple of Jesus, he was actually one of Jesus' closest friends. Because along with James and Peter, John made up Jesus' inner circle. And John sometimes went by what is seemingly a self-given nickname, (laughs) the disciple whom Jesus loved. Or perhaps a better translation, the disciple beloved by Jesus. Jesus. You see, John experienced the love of God through Christ in such a life-changing way that he talks about it over and over and over again in both his account of Jesus' life and in the letters to the early church. And this letter we now call 1 John is probably written about 60 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So John is kind of an old man now, but he's still very active in church leadership and overseeing a network of churches in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey. And he writes this letter because some of the churches he's working with are struggling to understand just how much God loves them. You see, they're going through a lot of stuff. They're being persecuted by Rome. They're really struggling. And this message that John gives about not just how much God loves them, but how that love should actually change everything. It's a message just as vital today as it was back then. So let's dive in. 1 John 4, starting in verse 7, it says this. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Again, John doesn't just say God does love, although that's certainly true. He says God is love. So love isn't just what God does. It's a central aspect of his character. How do we know that's true? Well, John explains, verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is how we know God loves us. And as Paul says in his New Testament letter to the early church, Jesus is the fullness of God in human bodily form. So we can know God loves us and that he is love because he put on flesh as the person of Jesus. He came to earth and he he showed us what being a full and free human is supposed to look like by battling against the forces of evil and uplifting the oppressed and healing the brokenness caused by sin and ultimately laying his life down on the cross. Now these verses, the ones I just read, they're really what kind of the whole passage hinges on. So I want to take a minute and I want to show you two really amazing things that we often miss because of the differences in culture and language in this text. So you may know that the New Testament, most of it, it's in the Bible, um, where 1 John 4 is located. It was originally written in Greek, which is the language of the time and place of the first century. So the first thing I want to show you is this part. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So in our English Bibles, and up on the screen, right, it looks like the word loved is used in the same way twice, right? 
Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. But in the Greek, the word is actually in two different tenses. Now, my wife was an English major, so she already knows what that means. But for the rest of us, let me explain. We loved God is in the perfect tense, which denotes a completed action, meaning that our action of loving God, it happened in the past. It may or may not be present now, and it may or may not happen again in the future. So a more accurate translation would say, we have loved God, but he loved us. It's in the imperfect tense which means that not only has God demonstrated his love for us in the past, he will continue demonstrating his love for us in the future. It says that God's love is constant. It is past, present, and future, eternal and unchanging. Again, the work of Jesus didn't somehow allow God to love us. It announced that God has always loved us and that he always, always So that's the first really beautiful thing tucked away in the passage. The second thing is a little bit more obvious. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is called an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If you have some church background, you may have heard a phrase like this before atoning, or you may be familiar with like atonement theories that surround the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you aren't used to this kind of language, a phrase like atonement theory can sound somewhat inaccessible, but really it's just an attempt to explain why Jesus died on the cross, what happened when he did, and what happened through the resurrection. And like I said a moment ago, to understand what atonement means, we have to start by looking at it in its kind of original context, culture, and language. So bear with me for a second. I'm going to nerd out about this word. The Greek word for atonement here is halosmos, and it is only used one other time in the entire Bible. And it's just a few pages before, 1 John chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning, halosmos, sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So it's only used two times. In the entire Bible. And both times it's used inside of this same phrase from John. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, even though this word's only used twice in the Bible, it's actually a word that was really familiar to anyone who would have received this letter from John. It was a word used all the time in the first century. And that's because halosmos was often used in cult religions of the day. And it was used to describe how angry gods pacified their wrath against humanity. So why would John use that word? Well, Jesus and many of his other early Christian leaders and followers were famous for taking something familiar to their audience and totally flipping it on its head, turning it around. And that's exactly what's happening here. So listen to how New Testament scholar Kenneth Woos describes it. The pagan cult worshiper brought gifts to his God to appease the God's wrath and make him favorable in his attitude toward him. But the God of Christianity needs no gifts to appease his wrath and make him favorable toward the human race. Divine love springs spontaneously from his heart. This is the picture we have of God throughout the entire biblical story. But it's especially clear through God in Jesus Christ. As John says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. So before John used it here, that word halosmos or atonement, it had always been associated with sacrifice to appease a deity that was so angry with humanity, it needed to pour its wrath out on someone, an individual, so that it could kind of appease itself, exhaust itself. And because they had no legal rights in the culture, this someone, this individual, was often a young woman, a slave, or a child. Because it was believed that only after this deity could exhaust its anger on one person could it calm down enough not to wipe out the whole human race. Horrific, right? Well, over the last few hundred years, this horrific cultish understanding of atonement has infested major parts of Christianity, especially here in the West, We have portrayed God as this monster who is so angry with humanity that he kills his own son in the most painful way possible just to exhaust his wrath and calm down enough not to destroy us all. But I'm here to tell you that that's just simply not what Scripture teaches. 
In fact, it's the opposite of what John is saying here. It's the opposite of what Jesus actually did. And this toxic theology that makes our God out to be no different from some cruel and vindictive cult deity has to be called out for what it is, which is false and damaging. Because God is love. And like John said, in case you're wondering what love looks like, love looks like God in Christ coming to die on the cross and rising from the grave for us and for the whole world. You see, our God, who is love, could not be further from the monster gods who demand human sacrifice in order to appease their anger at humanity. When the biblical authors use that familiar word, halosmos, or atonement, to describe what happened on the cross, they are not likening God to cult deities. They are doing the opposite. They are contrasting the character of God with all these other cult gods. You see, cult gods created humans to please them and appease them. But our God, it says in Genesis, created humans to rule and reign alongside of him. Cult gods see humans as slaves, but our God in Christ calls us friends, brothers and sisters. Cult gods require human sacrifice, but listen to this. Our God in Christ sacrifices himself. He sacrifices himself. And what else could that sacrifice be except pure and perfect love? As John said back in his account of Jesus' life, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. If you don't get anything else this morning, I want you to hear that God loves you, and that he always has. He always has. The death and resurrection of Jesus is a celebration of that love. It's a revelation. It's a confirmation. It did not somehow allow him to love you. He does, and he always will. And receiving that love from God, it should change everything. And that's exactly what John says as he brings this passage to a close. 1 John 4, 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, since he made himself the halosmos, the atoning sacrifice, since he so loved us, he put on flesh, since he so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we will live in him and he is in us. He has given us his spirit. Now, right there, that right there is the key to everything. This is the difference between God's love just being some cool concept we talk about at church and God's love being something we lavish on everyone we meet. It's the difference between us treating the resurrected Jesus like some get-out-of-hell-free card and us being empowered by the resurrected Jesus to actually live our lives like him. John ends by once more making it clear that this isn't a fear-based relationship between God and humanity. And then he reminds us where the power to love others really comes from. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. We can love others because we have received the love of God. And I hope this goes without saying, but y'all, loving others isn't like passing out evangelism tracts on street corners, okay? Christ-like love happens in relationships. It's sacrificial, and it's supportive, and it's always looking for ways to meet needs. My friend Letty experienced love like this when she was working with refugees from Eastern Europe while she was in college. You see, Letty was working with this Christian organization, but their goal wasn't just to go out on the streets, pass out the tracts, get as many people to sign a conversion sheet as possible. It was first and foremost to just share the love of Jesus with people. And it was a smart strategy, too, because many of these refugees, they actually came from countries where Christianity was weaponized and used to centralize power with tyrants, similar to what we're seeing happening between the Russian Orthodox Church and Vladimir Putin right now. And so most of these refugees that she was working with, they hated Christianity, and they had stopped believing in God a long time ago. So all that Letty and this organization did was cook meals for these folks and share conversations. So Letty had been doing that for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. And then one day, a refugee that she'd gotten to know especially well asked her about becoming a Christian. 
And Letty was surprised, right? She said, after all you've been through, man, at the hands of people claiming the name of Jesus, you want to be a Christian? Why? And the refugee said this, because even when my head doesn't believe in Jesus, my stomach knows he is real. Because even when my head doesn't believe in Jesus, my stomach knows he is real. That man didn't place his faith in the resurrected Jesus because of a great sermon or a moving worship song or a compelling evangelism tactic. He did it because Letty fed him. Because she met a real, tangible need that he had. And so even when doubts swirled in his heart, even when his head remembered the way that Jesus and Christianity had been weaponized against him and violently used to oppress him, his stomach knew that something about this was real. And he wanted a part of it. He did it because Letty shared Christ-like love with him in the form of food and friendship. And this is why Easter matters so much. Because the death and resurrection of Jesus isn't the reason God loves us. It's the revelation of his love that's been there all along. And it's not just for me, and it's not just for you. It is for every single person we encounter. Because after receiving this love, we are called to share it with others. That's what it means to be a Christian. We're going to end the gathering this morning by singing a new song about just how beautiful and life-changing the love of God really is. So I'm going to pray, and then if you're comfortable doing so, after I pray, I'd love to have you stand, and we're going to sing this song about God's love together. Lord God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the way that you love us, the way that the cross and the resurrection reveal that you have loved us always, and that you always will. God, we pray that like Letty, you would put opportunities before us, put opportunities in our path to share your love with people. God, sometimes with words, sometimes with stories, sometimes with scripture, but also sometimes with food and friendship and a couple of dollars to someone who's struggling or an invitation to sleep on a couch. Whatever it looks like, God, I pray that we would so open our arms to receive your love and you would so pour it out on us as you have through the cross and resurrection that it would truly overflow everywhere we go. That when people meet us, they can't help but walk away saying, gosh, that person is loved and that person loves me. God, we believe that your love has changed the world and that it will change everyone in it. So we pray that you would make us agents of this love, purveyors of it wherever we go. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.